Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. We're wrapping up our Christmas series, Tis the Season. Yes, I know, this is the day after Christmas. And you're probably still picking up Christmas paper from off the floor. One or two of the toys have been broken already. There's leftover turkey and stuffing and all the trimmings in the refrigerator. And you're probably still stuffed from that great dinner that you had yesterday. The plan today is to return some of those unwanted Christmas presents. Then you're probably looking forward to a good lunch with that, all that leftovers in the fridge and then have a nice nap later on. Yep, that's what we call the day after Christmas. And so is my message. It is called, Towards the Day After Christmas. But did you realize that the three wise men, and we only assume that they were three wise men because of the amount of gifts that they brought, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so, how many could there be, right? Well, anyway, the reality is, we don't really know how many there, there were. But we're going to try to find out. So we we'll jump right into our message today. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 6. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, when wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophets. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel." The scripture starts out in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. This isn't bright and early Christmas morning. Jesus is no longer wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Christmas is over. It has come and gone at least two years by now. But why do you say that, Brother Kenny? Have you never seen the nativity scene? Of course I have. Every year I proudly honor those men from the east for traveling down to Jerusalem to worship Jesus by shamelessly displaying them in my manger scene. All three of them. But nonetheless, I want you to glance on down to verse 11 and verse 16. Matthew chapter 2 verse 11 says, and when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. According to Matthew, Jesus was no longer in the manger. He was actually living in a house somewhere in Bethlehem with his mother, Mary. Now, verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise man, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coast thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. As I said, by the time the Magi, or the, the, the wise men, got to Jerusalem, baby Jesus was no longer a baby. He was now a young child. He was a toddler. He, he, no longer, he was no longer wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger, but rather he was living in a home. In, in a house somewhere in Bethlehem, most likely with a family member since his parents were from Bethlehem. Now these wise men, or the Magi, came to Jerusalem from the east. And if we take a look at the map, you'll notice that both Babylon and Susa are east of Jerusalem. Of course, Babylon is the capital of Babylon, the house of King Nebuchadnezzar's palace. And Susa also known as Shuzan, was one of the royal cities of, and the capital of Medo-Persian Empire and was where the royal palace was located as well. So, it would stand to reason that these men came from one of those two cities because of their importance in times past. And I'm about to share my reason for thinking that way. Uh, uh, 
I'm going to ask this question. How did these men know whose star it was that they saw rise? How did they know what it actually meant? Well, we don't know for sure because the scripture doesn't tell us explicitly. But we have several clues. So let us go back to the time of Daniel. Daniel chapter 5, verse 10 through 12. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall, and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers. Because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. King Belshazzar, King Nebuchadnezzar's son, was given a great feast for a thousand of his nobles. During the partying and during all the festivities and in the happiness of too much drink, Belshazzar commanded that the gold and silver vessels that were taken from the Lord's temple in Jerusalem when his father, King Nebuchadnezzar, had went down there and destroyed the temple and took all of the temple vessels back to Babylon with him and he burnt and destroyed the temple itself. And he had them stored in Babylon. Now, his son, Belshazzar, called for those vessels, the gold and silver vessels, so that he, his nobles, his wives, his concubines, could drink from them. When the king's spirit was merry with wine, he started praising the gods of gold and silver, and immediately a hand appeared on the wall and began to write, which terrified, and I believe rightly so, terrified the king, King Belshazzar. He called loudly for the enchanters. He called loudly for the Chaldeans. He called loudly for the astrologers to come in, come in quickly, so that they might interpret the writings, but none of them could and because of the great fear and all the confusion and all of the, the, the commotion that was going on in the banqueting hall, the queen came in to see what was going on. And she declared that Daniel, Daniel could interpret it. Call Daniel. She reminded him that Daniel was promoted to the chief of all these men that he had just called in, which none of them could interpret the writings. So this Daniel, the same Daniel that would be later thrown into the lion's den, but you know that story. They, he was called in. And indeed, he did interpret. He was able to interpret the scriptures or, or, or interpret the writing that was on the wall. The point here is, though, is that Daniel was the chief of all those enchanters. He was the chief of the Chaldeans. He was the chief of the astrologers. Daniel was a very wise man. Daniel was a man full of faith and full of grace. A man highly loved by God because of his strong love and devotion to God. Daniel did not hide his Jewish faith, nor did he hide his love and trust in Almighty God. And God rewarded him for it. God gave him dreams and visions of the future. He gave him scenes of the future that, that other prophets envied. He let Daniel see things that were hard to understand and even harder to interpret. Things that were to come. Things that had already come to pass. Things that, were, that are still waiting to come to pass. What I'm saying is this. Daniel was given inside information. And I believe some of that inside information was about the soon to come Jewish Savior. The Savior of the world. The long-awaited Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Daniel would have known that. He would have taught that. And that's how the astrologers would, would know what to look for. And they would know what it meant when they saw it. They had Daniel for a teacher. They knew and saw for themselves what Daniel did. What Daniel knew. How all the things that he predicted came to pass. They saw him being put in the lion's den. 
They saw him being delivered. So they believed what he said. So all of these teachings were passed down from teacher to student and on down the line. Even after all of these years, some 500 years had passed, they still believed because they were taught by someone who really believed. So the question is, why are our children growing up in Sunday school? Why are our children attending youth groups, youth meetings? But as soon as they graduate high school, they graduate church. Also, why are so many Christians uh, being a part of the church, being involved in the church, serving the church boards and being active? Then they just begin to grow lukewarm. And they begin to drift away. Why? Why is that? Now with these men, even after five centuries, these wise men or astrologers were still looking for and could recognize the promised Messiah's star when it rose. His own people did not recognize. The scripture says that he came to his own and they did not know him. They did not recognize him. They did not receive him. Yet these men knew. They received him. They came to worship him. So these men, when they saw that star rise, they began to pack up. They began to make plans for a trip that would take them 16, over 1,600 miles one way. A trip that distance would take somewhere around eight months or more, one way. That is where, that is if they were coming from Babylon. If they were coming from Susa, it would take even longer. Now, I want you to understand that these men just didn't jump into the car, car airport transport service and get them to drive them to the airport and jump on a plane and head on down to Jerusalem. No, they had to walk. They had to ride some type of animal. And usually it was a camel for those long distances because a camel was preferred over horses because they didn't have to water the camel as much. So these men, as soon as they saw the star, they began to pack. They began to prepare for a year and a half long trip, a round trip that took them somewhere 18 to 20 months, maybe longer. So... It was a whole lot of organization, a whole lot of organizing that went into this planning. So they would probably have to take their meat on hoof. They would probably have to take their milk on hoof. Whether it was cow milk or whether it was goat's milk, they had to take these animals with them because they didn't have refrigeration. So that a trip that long, there was no way for them to keep all of that. So they would have to carry live animals and have food. So they would have to make sure that they had enough water for all of these animals. They would have to make sure that they have enough water for themselves and for the crew that they, they would um, have to take with them because they probably had workers to help take care of the animals, to help pack and unpack, help to set up the tents at night, help to cook. They probably had to have bodyguards as well because they were tr probably traveling with a lot of money. We know they came with Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But they had to have silver and gold otherwise for, for spending. Because nobody goes on a trip without spending money. So they had to have some spending money. And there were robbers and thieves that, that would try to take over caravans and rob them. So they probably had bodyguards to go with them. It was a huge procession going down to Jerusalem. This wasn't just some weekend getaway that you pack an overnight bag and you're out of here. No, this took a lot of planning, a lot of effort. As I said, there was a lot of pre-trip preparation that went into this journey. But today, people have no plans for eternity. These men were planning a 20-month, let's say, let's go for broke, 24-month trip. This is eternity, and people do not have plans for eternity. They don't even give eternity a second glance, a second thought. You know, I was talking with a woman uh, several years ago, and I, I asked her, I said, don't you think that eternity would be important? She said, no. 
So you don't think it's important. I said, but if it lasts forever, surely you would think that it's important. She said, no. People have no plans for eternity. They will plan a two-week vacation, a ten-day vacation, and they would save for years to go to exotic vacation spots that last ten days. Eternity lasts forever, and they don't give it a second thought. Christmas has come and gone. Jesus has been born in Bethlehem. Jesus lived. He grew up. He became a man. He taught. He was betrayed. He was crucified. He was dead and buried. On the third day, he rose again. He's ascended into heaven. And he's coming back. Here. Other words, his star has risen. So the question is, are you seeking him who is born the king of the Jews? Are you seeking the savior of the world? Are you seeking the lover of your soul? Don't let the pressures of life distract you. Don't let the lure of wealth divert your attention. Don't let the length of the journey intimidate you. Don't let the treacherousness or the perilousness of the road trip keep you from starting. I admit, serving Jesus is not always fun and games. But neither is not serving Him. It isn't always blessings and mountaintops. It isn't always sunshine and cool breezes. But neither is not serving Him. Serving Him has ups and downs. It has valleys and rain. It has dark clouds. It has persecution. God did not promise us a happy, go lucky life. We are called to do His will. Whatever that will is and wherever that will takes us, we're called to do His will. Then if we endure, He has promised us a perfect eternity. That's where the perfection comes in. That's where the happy, go lucky life comes in. In eternity, where it counts. Right here, this temporal life, do not count. This is only preparation for eternity. Let us make plans for eternity. I want you to take note of this. Look at verse, verse 2, or verse 7, sorry. Matthew chapter 2, verse 7. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. I used to think that the Magi or the wise men went to Herod to inquire about this Christ child, this king of the Jews, where he was born. But they did not. Herod had to summon them. The lesson here is, do not seek the righteous among the unrighteous. All those progressive churches that teach you that you can live any old way you want. You can do any old thing that you want. You can say any old thing that you want. And it is all fine because after all, God understands. God loves everybody. Well, God might love everybody, but God has standards. There is a right way to live and there is a wrong way to live. I'm here to tell you today, do not seek the righteous among the unrighteous. Do not go seeking those who say that you can live any old way and that you will be okay. Because God will accept you and what you do. It does not matter. Yes, indeed it does matter. That is a lie. There's a right way to live and there's a wrong way to live. And Jesus said that if you love me, if you love him, you will do what he said. And he left us a perfect example. He left us himself as an example. Therefore, there is now no excuse. Yet, there are those who try to corrupt the gospel and try to lead others astray with lukewarmness and plain old rebellion. Look at, chap uh, at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6 through 9. For among them are those who creep into houses and capture weak women, burdened with sin and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jamborees 
opposed Moses, so those men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was of those two men. Paul said to avoid people who have an appearance of godliness. He said to avoid those people who live any old way. To avoid those people who teach you can live any old way. And if those people are teachers, even more so, avoid them. Avoid them like the plague. He goes on to encourage Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10 through 12. You, however, have followed. He's talking to Timothy. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecution and suffering that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Listen, every day is not Christmas. Eventually, Christmas will be over and the morrow starts. Now, pick up the Christmas paper. Pick up that wrapping paper from off the, way, off the floor. Put away the Christmas gifts. Put away the Christmas delicacies. And start serving the normal food. We must serve the Lord uphill and downhill. In other words, Paul said that if you desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you will be persecuted. And even more so when the end days begin to come. And I believe we are living in those end days right now. Persecution is breaking out all over the world. Even here in the free country. Even here in the free world. Persecution is breaking out. We are living in those last days. This is the day after Christmas. You have your calling. You have your gifts. The presence of the Holy Spirit is with you. Now go forth and conquer for the Lord. Jesus said to his disciples in John chapter 4 verse 35 through 38. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life. So that sower and reaper may rejoice. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored. And you have entered into their labor. So I ask you, are you gathering fruit for eternal life? Are you building up treasure in heaven that will last forever and ever? Or are you just squandering your time? Are you wasting your time? Are you wasting your days with things that will not last? Work for things that will last. I encourage you. It is not a one-man show. For one tills the ground, another sows, and still another water, waters. But it is God who gives the increase. I have a friend who is a, a, a farmer. He works 12 hours a day. And he works alone on this farm, a huge farm, a 12,000 hectare farm. He does it all by himself. A hectare is 10,000 square meters. He tills. He sows, he reaps, but praise the Lord for him, he has equipment that he operates that help him complete all of this. But the thing is, he has to work really, really hard to get the job done in a timely manner. And if he waits too long to, say, plant his seeds, the harvest won't be as plentiful as it should be, which means his profits aren't as much as they could be. So he is diligent, he's very diligent to make sure that everything goes as planned and that his harvest is the max that it should be. He has to make sure he works the ground so that the weeds begin to germinate. Then he has to work the ground again to kill those weeds. Then he sows his seeds. Then he takes care of his plants. He makes sure that the plants are watered. And then comes the harvest. And he has the harvest. If he takes this kind of care and planning to make sure he gets the healthiest and the most out of his harvest, how much more should we be diligent 
to make sure or to ensure that the harvest of souls are plentiful. Look around. I tell you, like Jesus told his disciples, the fields are white unto harvest, but the laborers are few, and they're getting fewer and fewer every day. Next week will be the first Sunday of 2022. So I ask you, are you laboring for the Lord? Or maybe you don't know who Jesus is at all, but you would like to. Everyone who labors in the field for Jesus will receive a crown of life. Would you like to receive a crown of life? Would you like to live forever? Would you like to live in eternity in blissfulness with Jesus forever? It has no end. It will be forever. No more fear, no more sorrow, no more hurt, no more pain. No more want. Would you like to live in a place like that? All you have to do is to ask Jesus. He paid for it all. He paid for your ticket into eternity. All you got to do is to go and claim it. Let me tell you how you claim it. Say this prayer with me. If you're interested in claiming your ticket into eternity, it's a free ticket. It's bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. Would you like that? Pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me, for purchasing my salvation, for giving me the free gift of, a, of life. I ask you to forgive me, and I receive your forgiveness now. I receive that gift of salvation. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is to begin to pray for yourself. Daniel prayed three times a day. I would suggest you pray at least two times a day. Once in the morning and once at night. When you, once you wake up and just before you go to sleep, say your prayers. Begin to communicate with the Lord, and the Lord will communicate with you. Get yourself a Bible. Read your Bible. Learn the Scriptures. Highlight the Scriptures. Learn the promises. Jesus is faithful. He will fulfill every promise that He has made to you. Learn those promises. Stand on those promises. Then find yourself a church, a Bible-believing church. Not a progressive church. Not any old thing goes, church but a true Bible believe in church, a church that believes there's a right way to live and a wrong way to live. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. Work and labor in that church. And when Jesus comes back, He'll find you doing what it is that you're supposed to be doing, and He'll take you to be with Him, that where He is, there you shall be forever and ever. Would you not like that? I know I would like that. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us that, that, that free gift. Now, Today is the last Sunday of 2021, and a lot of you have been with us all year. You watch us every, every Sunday. You, you watch our scripts. You watch the, the, the videos that we post, and we appreciate you so much. I want to say a heartfelt thank you to each and every one of you. Thank you for being with us throughout this year, and I want to say that from my family to your family, we wish you a happy and prosperous new year. May the Lord's blessing rest upon you. And I want you to know that we love you and we pray for you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.